over the course of the past few videos, we've had opportunity to occasionally talk about specific Jewish women as they appear in uh, ancient Israel, in both the biblical context and in a larger archaeological context. Uh, but let's just take a step back and have kind of a macro look at the uh, methodology of studying women in ancient Israel, the, the nature of sources, and some of the challenges that are associated with this extremely important topic. One of the ideas that's circulating right now, which I think is a very valuable project, is something called the Kranjek test, named after this person, Danielle Kranjek, uh, also pronounced Kranjets. I actually had to contact her to find out uh, which pronunciation they use, and, but in America they tolerate Kranjek. At any rate, um, she actually is trained as a historian, so it was a nice conversation. Her test, um, which gained a lot of popularity in the Jewish world recently, especially on what we call from Twitter, uh, is inspired by the so-called Bechdel test. The Bechdel test is something that has been used for modern films to sort of uh, purity check the, uh, the quality of a film from the perspective of a feminist analysis. And that is, uh, in order to pass the Bechdel test, a movie has to have two women speaking with each other about something other than a male character, right? So it, you would think that this would be a totally normal thing to do, but apparently a lot of films don't pass this. I've seen some other details that suggest that the women should have names, they should be named characters and so on. And obviously the idea is to try and expand the presentation of women uh, even in something as contemporary as modern film to try to, uh, you know, discuss women as real people. Now, Danielle Kranjek takes this a different uh, direction and says that in terms of the study of the Jewish tradition, any source sheet, which is a, a tried and true pedagogic model where, you know, you'll choose quotes from rabbinic literature, from the Bible and other things and put them together on a mimeographed or uh, photocopied sheet, and people will look at these sources. Uh, she proposes that any source sheet that includes at least two texts must also include at least one non-male identified text. That's a very valuable idea to try and expand the, you know, simply the universe of our awareness when it comes to uh, rabbinic theology and writings, and I would love very much to do this with history as well. Uh, we see that we are living in an era where this incredibly important aspect of the human condition, the experience of women in history, has been, you know, ignored for centuries, and it's so hard to find women's voices in medieval and in ancient sources, uh, but it's something that we really want to resurrect, and we want to try and recreate as much as possible what the experience of of living was for fully half of the human population. We happen to live in a cultural moment where this is unusually suppressed as well. I'm sure some of you will be following the controversy regarding uh, the, the decision of uh, some Jewish papers in the media to not publish faces of women. I'm not going to go there for now. Perhaps we'll return to it uh, in a, a semester or two when we get to the 20th century. But I think it is important to point out that this is not at all a uniform practice. It, it's really on one particular spot in the spectrum. Uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who we've mentioned in other contexts before, was especially noted for insisting that in any children's book portrayals, such as this Tzivos Hashem uh, handbook for Jewish children, uh, if there is a male child portrayed, there should always be a female child portrayed as well. So this is something that, that has pushback in all sectors of the Jewish population, uh, and it's just another example of the Kranjek test kind of expressing itself uh, culturally. Uh, when we come to our challenge, which is trying to understand the experience of women in ancient Israel, the difficulty is that the vast majority of our sources are by men, for men, and about men. This is especially true in the literary realm. If we look, for example, at classical rabbinic texts, we have the Mishnah, which on the one hand you say, great, look at this, it has a whole section called Nashim, which is all about women. That should be it, right? But not really, because it's mainly describing how men relate to women, marriage, divorce, leveret marriage, and so on. So uh, women are included in the canon 
uh, but at the same time, they're kind of fenced off. Another way to look at it is in the temple courtyard, there was a section called Ezrat Nashim, the courtyard of women. So that means that women were part of the overall functioning of the temple. But on the other hand, there was a relegated space for them. By the way, we should also understand there are relegated spaces for all kinds of people, people who are not Kohanim and not Leviim and not involved in the sacrifice and things like that. But the point holds true. They are mentioned, they're part of the story, but they're also relegated. And our idea is to try to understand their experience in the broader scope of Jewish history. Uh, when it comes to archaeological sources, you know, archaeological sources, finds that you get at digs and so on, uh, they are extremely limited in nature, much more so even than literary sources, and they're incredibly difficult to interpret. As we saw, for example, with the Bar Kokhba caves a while ago, and we'll speak about them a little more, you know, you find cosmetics in a cave, and it's reasonable to assume that these cosmetics belong to a woman, but not necessarily. Uh, you know, ancient men wore coal, for example, a kind of eye makeup. So what can we really glean from women's history when a lot of the sources are anonymized like that? Very difficult to interpret them. If you find a bowl, a serving bowl, one may assume perhaps that it was more likely that it belonged to a woman or a woman was more likely to have handled it. Uh, but there's no guarantees on that either. I mean, so it's very difficult to actually, on a theoretical level, reconstruct women's experience of history in ancient Israel based on the sources we have. There are some really exciting materials, however, especially when you get to late antiquity. Uh, for example, we have this Rufina inscription, which comes from Smyrna in the 3rd century. And uh, if you can make out some of the Greek alphabet there, it's basically a funerary inscription that describes uh, this woman as uh, a an archisynagogus. That's right at the right side of the top line and then going into the second line it says archi synagogues which means leader of the synagogue and we actually have quite a few examples of women who are represented with this particular title now it doesn't necessarily mean from the larger context that they were like say the rabbi or even the president of the synagogue it may mean something like major donor to the synagogue but nevertheless these kinds of inscriptions give us just a glimpse uh, into perhaps exceptional women who were wealthier or more influential, but they definitely had these significant roles, as we shall see, uh, not so much in today's lecture, but as we move forward, I'd like to highlight these in order to try and pass the Kranjek test as much as possible. Okay, let's just look at the biblical text for a minute now. Now, uh, one of the, there, there are, there are literally thousands of women in the biblical text, to be sure. In many cases, however, they are nameless or they are named in relationship to men. Like, like for example, the wife of Noah, the, uh, the children of Lot, the daughters of Lot, uh, Jephthah's daughter. You know, we don't know their names from the biblical text, but they are named usually in some kind of relationship to, to men. Sometimes they're identified in terms of their character, uh, or skills like the wise woman of Tekoa, or sometimes uh, based on their place, like the witch of Endor. Uh, but there are literally hundreds, thousands of women in uh, the Hebrew scriptures, and, and we don't know much about them in person. But there are some fascinating aspects when you include the oral tradition as well. Have a look at this picture here. Obviously, it's a piece of Persian art, but you wonder, like, um, that looks like a relatively familiar scene, right? It looks like uh, a Joseph running away from Eshet Potiphar, the wife of Potiphar, a very famous scene, of course, in Genesis, where she's grabbing onto his cloak as he's trying to escape her. And here's another aspect that's really interesting in the Jewish tradition is that although they may be nameless in the biblical text, the rabbinic tradition preserves the oral tradition in which there are lots of names and lots of additional details. And it, it, one of the crucial things about studying the Torah in a Jewish sense is you need to have two fingers. You have to have one finger in the written text and one finger in the oral tradition to understand it 
as Jews have for hundreds of years. A one easy way to do that is one finger in the text, one finger in Rashi, as we saw, for example, in the last lecture about matrilineal descent. So anyways, why am I bringing a piece of Persian art? Because in the Persian tradition, there's actually a name for Eshet Potiphar, Zulaicha is her name. And now this is not the Jewish oral tradition, although maybe the Muslims are borrowing something from the Jewish uh, oral tradition, who knows? But the same phenomenon exists in the sense of there's a lot more detail than you get in the Bible itself. There are many examples in the Bible of strong Jewish women. Typically, they're named when they are strong. And often, they're quite strong in the sense of defying male demands. Uh, for example, Sarah, who insists on the expulsion of Hagar, and Abraham, when he hesitates, God speaks to him and says, listen to her. The oral tradition, Rashi quotes, saying, "Because why should you listen to her? Because she is a greater prophet than you are. Uh, Rebecca, of course, famous scene, when she decides she knows better than her husband Isaac as to which of her two sons, Esau and Jacob, receive the blessing. And in fact, she engineers Jacob's reception of the blessing rather than Esau. Uh, Hannah, in Hebrew, Hannah, you know, it's hard for me to think in terms of the Hebrew pronunciation, the English pronunciation sometimes. But Hannah, of course, uh, is challenged by Eli the Kohen in the book of Samuel, and Hannah stands her ground and says, no, I'm praying to God, and in fact, she becomes the model of our prayer. Uh, we even have female warriors, uh, like the woman who uh, killed Sheva ben Bichri, also in the book of Samuel, or Yael, who uh, plants a tent peg through the temple of Sisera and saves the Jewish people. You know, fascinating examples. So, and we have to add to this that in the Bible, there are many negative portrayals of women as well, such as Jezebel and Athalia. You know, these are, ex you know, complex examples of character that, uh, you know, they certainly are... Uh, smaller in scope than the number of strong male characters, but nevertheless, they have depth and sophistication. It's hard to really analyze them from a historical perspective. As we saw in a previous lecture, you know, occasionally these tempting artifacts come up from archaeological finds, such as the, uh, the seal that may have belonged to Jezebel. But for the most part, we are totally reliant on the biblical text. And so therefore, the kind of tools that we need to try and explore women's history tend to be more literary in nature than historical per se. Nevertheless, we're going to make full use of the text to try and understand everything we can about them. Let us uh, conclude this discussion with one sort of overarching thing that's really important to understand the experience of women in ancient Israel. And that is that, you know, we have to transport ourselves from an early 20th century environment in which we are increasingly importuned to adopt a more androgynous view of religion to uh, a more ancient view in which there was a very radically different experience of Judaism by men and women. One can certainly see echoes of it in the most traditional of communities today, the, the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, but this is something that would have been pervasive in the ancient world. In the next lecture, we'll talk about some exceptional women, but when we want to look at women in general in Israel, one of the most important things to really bear in mind is the fact that men and women were not necessarily practicing the same religion, or maybe I can say it in a little bit better way. Uh, they were practicing the same religion, but there are two different tracks. There's a men's track and a women's track. Um, there's a, a lot to say about this in terms of religious studies, but in terms of kind of an anthropological approach, let's look at this one basic difference between men and women and how they would have approached Judaism. The Judaism is, of course, heavily dependent on the interpretation of the commandments. How exactly are Jews to translate the biblical text as mediated by the oral tradition and the Pharisees into actual demands on daily life? So one of the ways to categorize the, the commandments, which, by the way, will be a major enterprise of the medieval thinkers, and we'll return to that, God willing, in, in a few months, um, is to divide them into four different quadrants, shown here. So on the, uh, the x-axis, we can place negative commandments, that is, thou shalt nots, things you're not supposed to do. 
and positive commandments, things that you are supposed to get up and do. And then on the y-axis, we can posit those actions which are defined by time, that is, they're restricted to a particular time, or those which are open-ended and always apply. Let me give you a few examples. A uh, negative commandment that is defined by time is no eating bread on the holiday of Passover, right? You can eat bread lots of other times during the year, but on the week of Passover, no bread. Okay, fine. Uh, how about negative not defined by time? No pork. It is uh, thou shalt not, and it is not defined by time. Now, a positive commandment that is not defined by time would be something like honor your parents. You have to honor your parents. Kids, I hope you're listening. You have to honor your parents. There's no time when this is no longer applicable. What about a positive commandment which is defined by time? Uh, let's say the, uh, the prayers of Judaism, which are recited typically in a fixed window called morning, a fixed window called afternoon or mincha, and a fixed window called evening or ma'ariv, right? Chakras, mincha, ma'ariv. Uh, so there, this is one way you can categorize the commandments by negative versus positive and defined by time and not defined by time. To return to our discussion of women, here's the key point. Uh, women are obligated in three of these categories, but they are exempted from positive commandments defined by time. What does that mean, exempt? In general, it means women may choose to do these commandments if they so wish, and they will receive reward for performing these commandments. But if they choose to, they are exempt from performing them. Uh, there's uh, exceptions to this rule. For example, uh, lighting the candles Friday night, which is something which is specifically associated with women. Uh, that is a positive commandment, and it is associated with time. Um, uh, and it, women are generally considered obligated in that, or women at least are obligated before men are obligated. Another example would be drinking the four cups of wine on the holiday of Passover, also a positive commandment defined by time. Women are obligated, and the Talmud goes through a whole bunch of these exceptions and why they are exceptions, but the general rule is as such. Now, obviously, this has tremendous implications for lifestyle because one of the most disruptive elements of a day, that's putting it in the negative, it's a positive disruption, is prayer three times a day. And clearly, uh, for women who are more likely to be overwhelmingly involved in duties of the home, child care, and things like that, the exemption from positive commandments are uh, defined by time are extremely useful. You can't necessarily run off to shul when you have a screaming toddler. Um, and the there's a lot more to say about uh, why women were obligated in this way and not in another way, uh, and uh, whether the the rabbinic formulations come after the sociological realities or the other way around. And I will leave that with enthusiasm to people who are experts in religious studies and women's studies and so on. But nevertheless, this is the uh, schema of women's experience in the ancient world and for traditional communities through much of the, the medieval world and even into the modern world when you see the more orthodox communities. Um, there are also beyond this specific experiences that women would have had that tend to be more biological in nature, like for example, the regular visits to the mikvah, the, the immersion pool. And one of the most beautiful things that has been resurrected in the early modern period is the composition of specific prayers that are associated with women's experience of the commandments, such as going to the mikvah, experiencing menopause, childbirth, things like that, which are largely, you know, disappeared from the regular canon of text because uh, they were primarily guarded by men. A lot more to say about this, but we'll have to move forward into the future. So these kinds of uh, religious structural elements uh, help define many of the traditional divisions between men and women and their experience of Judaism and the world as a whole. Women tend to be relegated to the private sphere of the home, but not at all exclusively. We have lots of interesting examples of uh, women extending into the public sphere. Um, women 
tend to be involved in particular crafts such as the uh, production of clothing, very, very time-consuming work, uh, the, the production of, uh, you know, the care of the diet of the family and so on. Again, there's no way to say, and it would be inappropriate to say that this was universal, but it's certainly reliable to say that it was more common than not. In the next lecture, I'd like to look at three exceptional women. Um, two of which are exceptional because of their accomplishments, and a third who is exceptional because we simply happen to know a lot about her, and otherwise she may have been an absolutely average woman, and I'll give us some sense of what it must have been like for life in their cases in the first and second century. I hope you found this video useful, and thank you very much for watching.